All right. Thank you for being here. We're going to go ahead and get started. We might have a few people join us as we go along. Uh, my name is Stephen Campbell. I'm the director of admission for the Lamont School of Music, and I'm joined by Nikki Russell, which you can see there, senior financial aid advisor and financial aid. And tonight we're just going to go through some slides and we're going to talk about what office does what, right? So we have two offices represented here, the office of Lamont admission, uh, which is my office. And of course, the office of financial aid at the University of Denver, which is uh, Nikki's office. And it can be a little confusing sometimes for music applicants as they go through the process to know uh, who to go to for what, why are they getting uh, emails from both of these offices? What are they, what are they supposed to do and how are they different from uh, non-music applicants to the University of Denver. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about how you can determine or how you can know the costs of an undergraduate education here at, at DU. Um, it's also undergrad and grad, I suppose. We'll know, we'll talk about what the FAFSA and CSS profile are, what they're used for. We'll talk about what financial need means and how it's determined. And we'll talk about the types of aid that are available to you at the University of Denver. We'll talk about the appeals process, uh, Lamont appeals process, the spe special circumstance appeals process, kind of what happens next, what you should be doing right about now, what to expect as the year goes along. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, feel free at any point to drop your question in the Q&A function on Zoom they're down there at the bottom. Um, if if uh, it pops up throughout the, throughout the presentation, throw it in there in real time. And if it makes sense to answer, uh, in real time, we will. Otherwise, we'll, like I say, we'll have time to answer it at the end. So I mentioned you have two offices that you're working with when it comes to financial aid and scholarship at the University of Denver. One is the Office of Financial Aid, the main university financial aid office. This office is the one that determines the cost of attendance, so what it costs to go to DU. They evaluate a family's ability to pay which using something called the expected family contribution, which may or may not be uh, something you recognize right now, but you hopefully will by the end of this presentation. They offer scholarships, grants, loans, and work study. They distribute resources in an equitable manner, and they can counsel families on financial aid information, options, and resources throughout the process. The Lamont Office of Admission, some of these are gonna be similar, right? The big difference here for Lamont is that all of what we call institutional aid comes to music students from Lamont. So Lamont determines what's called the Lamont Scholarship, which takes into account musical merit, which is primarily on the basis of your audition or your portfolio, your interview, academic merit, which is determined by the Office of um, Undergraduate Admission, and also an internal review process for graduate students, and then financial need, where we would use the FAFSA and, and CSS profile that we'll talk about more later. All of those things are represented in one lump sum holistic award for undergraduate students. This is a really important distinction because we do not stack with other types of university aid, like the academic merit aid you'll see on the university website. Um, we take that into account, but we do not stack Lamont scholarships on top of that. So you'll be dealing with, with me primarily when it comes to issues of institutional aid or scholarship. We also seek to distribute resources in an equitable manner. And we also will counsel students and families regarding scholarship, uh, including requirements, because sometimes the music requirements are a little bit different, you know, requires ensemble participation, lessons, that sort of thing. Uh, and of course, financial issues. So we're gonna repeat ourselves a ton through this presentation, but um, if you're a music applicant, feel free to start with me if you have any questions about, about finances, about, um, about financial aid and scholarship. And if it's something that is better answered by Nikki's office, I'll route you over there and vice versa. I mean, one of the big takeaways we want you to get today is that uh, the Office of Financial Aid and the Office of Admission, um, we work really closely together. Uh, I'm in touch with, with Nikki and her colleagues all the time over there and, and vice versa. So you don't have to really have this flow chart down. Just reach out to the last person you can think of and we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out for you. I'm going to throw it over to Nikki to talk a little bit about determining costs and, and A to DU. All right, perfect. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into what this thing of cost of attendance is. This is going to be a word that you're going to hear a lot. 
um, as you're going through your college going journey and your college choice process. So what does cost of attendance mean? So your cost of attendance is going to be the total cost that it is to attend an institution. And this is mainly going to be um, composed of two separate components. So you're going to have your direct costs and you're going to have your indirect costs. So at DU, your direct costs are going to be those things that are actually going to show up on a student bill and be billed by DU. So these are going to be your tuition and fees and then on-campus room and board, which includes the residence hall that your student is living in and then their meal plan. These are things that are actually going to be on the student bill. But we also don't want to forget about those indirect costs. So indirect costs are things that aren't going to be directly billed by the institution, but they're still considered costs associated with attending college. Um, so we want to make sure that we're capturing them in that total cost of attendance. So this is going to be things like books and supplies, transportation, and personal expenses. So when your student gets their financial aid offer letter, um, it's going to have all of the aid that they're eligible for. And then it's also going to have this cost of attendance um, broken down by each component. So you'll be able to clearly see on there what their estimated direct costs are, what their estimated indirect costs are, and then how much financial aid is playing into that cost of attendance as well. So the first um, and a really important step for your student to be considered for financial aid is going to be filing the FAFSA. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid, uh, and this can be completed at fafsa.gov or studentaid.gov, um, either one. And then they also have a mobile app as well. So I know that sometimes when people hear FAFSA, they think it's going to be scary to fill out. They really have streamlined the process and it generally only takes about 20 to 30 minutes or so as long as you have all of the required documents in front of you when you're filling it out. Um, so this is available October 1st of every year. So the one for next academic year, the 2022-2023 academic year, that FAFSA is already open and available to complete. Um, after you complete the FAFSA, we at DU generally get it in our system within two to three business days after as long as you've already applied for admission. Um, so feel free to reach out to us if you know you want to check on the status of your FAFSA and we'll also always update your students application status portal when we've received it as well. Um, one important thing to keep in mind is that the FAFSA does use prior prior year tax data. So for the 22-23 FAFSA, this is going to use 2020 tax information. Um, so the reason that this is, is because we don't have our 2021 taxes done yet. So the Department of Education said, hey, let's make sure that everyone already has their taxes. They have everything available. We're going to use prior prior year data. And we do have a process, which we'll talk about a little bit later, in place for if your financial situation has changed since the 2020 tax year, you know, since it was two years ago, um, we have a process in place where we can walk you through a financial aid appeal to get that updated with some more accurate numbers. So the next application that we use at DU, and in addition to the FAFSA, is called the CSS Profile. So this is, uh, the profile is created and administered by the college board. It's used mainly by private colleges to determine age el aid eligibility for institutional financial aid. So these are gonna be things such as potentially scholarships, institutional need-based grants, things like that. And this can be completed at cssprofile.collegeboard.org. Your student may already have a login for this if they have taken the SAT. It's the same entity that administers the SAT. Um, but if they haven't, then they'll just go ahead and make an account and then fill out the profile. Um, one thing that is new this year is that the profile fee is going to be automatically waived for families with an AGI of less than $100,000. Um, so that's a really great addition that the CSS profile took this year um, to create a little bit more equity in the process and reduce that fee. The CSS profile is very similar to the FAFSA um, in a sense that it is gathering family information, it's gathering um, tax information, and it's gathering asset information. It just takes a little bit deeper dive than the FAFSA does. So you're going to notice that a lot of the questions are very similar with a few extra questions on the CSS profile. One of the main one that you're going to see is it is going to capture home equity. And the other thing is it does capture non-custodial parent information. So the non-custodial parent is if there is a divorce or separation within the household, the non-custodial parent is going to be that parent that the student lived with less in the year prior to filing the FAFSA. So that is the standard that is used to determine who the non-custodial parent is. 
Um, on the FAFSA, we're only going to be capturing the custodial parent and their spouse if they're remarried. On the CSS profile, we're going to be capturing the custodial parent and their spouse if remarried, as well as that non-custodial parent. And if you don't mind me jumping yep. in just briefly, um, this CSS profile, you know, we talked, she talked about how it's used to determine institutional aid, right, scholarship and those need-based the need-based aid coming from the university. You recall that I mentioned that for Lamont, all of that is in one uh, scholarship from Lamont. So we really, we require the CSS profile if you want to be considered for need-based aid. The FAFSA will not be enough for Lamont to consider you for need-based aid when we're developing that Lamont scholarship. Uh, and, and Nikki, maybe this is reductive, so correct me, but I, I've, all, I've heard that in our case, right, at a private school that uses the CSS profile and uses a, quite a bit of institutional aid, the FAFSA is really a loan application, right, in a lot of ways. It's, you're applying for federal. There are other types. We'll talk about the types of aid that are accessed by that, but um, FAFSA, you can think of as really accessing that federal aid, whereas CSS is really accessing the aid here at DU. Yeah, yep, that's a great way put, to put it. So the FAFSA, you're going to get your student loans, work study, and then any federal grants, such as like the Pell Grant or the SEOG grant. Um, but the main thing is going to be those student loans. So we use both the FAFSA and the CSS profile to evaluate a student for all forms of aid that they're eligible for. That's right family contribution. So how is that determined? So like I mentioned, we use both the FAFSA and the CSS profile in order to get this estimated family contribution number. So this is going to take into account um, a family's income. So it's going to look at the student and parent income if the student is a dependent student. It's also going to look at all of their taxed and untaxed income as well as assets, um, which include the things listed on the screen. And then there also is a few other factors that go into it. So it's going to factor in family size. And then also if you have any other kids in your household that are going to be attending college at the same time. Nikki, you may have seen in the Q&A, there's a question about the CSS. Does hmm. the CSS profile require tax data of any age? I know we're getting into now the difference between the CSS profile and the FAFSA. If that question makes sense to answer here, we, we can do that. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, so both the FAFSA and CSS profile are gonna use um, the tax data from the 2020 tax year. So they're gonna use the same tax return and everything when you're doing both, um, so the 2020 year. All right, so talking a little bit more about the differences between the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Um, so as I mentioned, the FAFSA is just gonna be capturing that parent of record. So the parent who the student lived with most in the preceding year. It does not collect, um, it does collect step parent data, but it does not collect non-custodial parent information. And it also does not collect home equity. It does collect the asset data as of the day the FAFSA is filed because we understand that assets are volatile. So we're just trying to capture it as of the day that the FAFSA was filed. And then it's gonna collect the 2020 tax and untaxed income. So then we look at the CSS profile. So it's going to collect the parent of record along with the student. It's also going to collect step parent data. It's going to collect home equity. It's going to collect the non-custodial parent information. Same process for assets. It's going to collect the assets as of the day that the profile is filed. And then it's still going to use that 2020 taxed and untaxed income. So there's not too many differences between the two. Um, the profile, like I said, just takes a little bit of a deeper dive into the family's financial situation so that we can really, really understand what's going on within a household and so that we can give them the most amount of aid possible. All right, so when you sit down to file both the FAFSA and the CSS profile, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have this information in front of you. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you have your tax returns, any W-2s, um, your driver's licenses, because it's gonna ask for your driver's license numbers, um, social security numbers, savings and checking account information, home value, and then other asset info if applicable. So if you have any investments, um, business info, farms, things like that, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have that all in front of you so that you can hopefully finish both of these applications in one sitting. Okay, so at DU, we use financial need to award different scholarships and grants. So 
When we determine financial need, we're looking at that total cost of attendance number and we're subtracting your estimated family contribution to then understand what your financial need may be. This is the number that helps us determine how we can equitably distribute our resources and how we can give you the most amount of aid possible. We're going to be looking at that financial need number. And which is exciting, aid is available to pay for college. And that is what we are here to talk to you about this evening. We know we want you to know that aid is available and we're here to help you explore all of the options that are available to you. So after completing your FAFSA and your CSS profile, you might be eligible for grants and scholarships, student loans and or work study. And then the sources of that funding can vary. So you might um, be eligible for some federal funding, some state funding, and then you may also be eligible for institutional funding. And when we say institutional funding, that basically means anything coming from DU directly. So those are going to be those merit scholarships um, or that you know, need-based component that Stephen mentioned earlier. That's coming from DU, so we consider that institutional financial aid. Right, and on that front, we, uh, institutional aid for all of you, if you're music applicants, once again, comes from us. So that scholarship top part of the types of aid we're going to be talking about, once again, comes from us. And we consider musical ability, academic merit, and financial need. The first two of those, musical ability and academic merit, this is going to happen automatically. If you are a complete applicant at Lamont School of Music, that means you've performed an audition, that means you've submitted all of the necessary application components, we are going to have what we need to determine the, both those first two components. Uh, once again, you need that FAFSA and CSS profile for that third component if you want us to take that into consideration. If you don't submit the CSS profile of the FAFSA, we will still consider you for the first two. So the vast majority, like 99% of Lamont applicants are going to be awarded scholarship in some capacity uh, through this process. And so the, the main takeaway is the thing that you need to do if you want need to be considered, financial need to be considered, you have to follow through on that CSS and FAFSA. Now, Nikki, are you going uh, to talk about grants and loans? Yeah. Yep, I can talk about that. So um, for you all, the grants that you would be receiving um, potentially would be through the federal government. So it would be like the Pell Grant or the SEOG grant. And those are both based on financial need. Um, loans is also based on completing the FAFSA. So the main forms of loans for undergraduate students is going to be the direct subsidized and unsubsidized loan. Um, so the biggest difference between those two is that with subsidized loans, the government pays the interest while the student is enrolled at least half time in a degree seeking program, whereas unsubsidized loans, those are going to start accruing interest right away. Um, another option that may be available to undergraduate students is called a Parent PLUS loan. So this is when a parent takes out a federal loan called the Parent PLUS loan on the student's behalf. Um, however, one thing to note is that it is in the parent's name, so that it is the parent's responsibility to mm -hmm. get that set up for repayment and pay that back. Um, the other form of loan that may be available is a private education loan. So these are going to be taken out through a third party. You know, we do have a preferred private education loan lender list on our website that can give you a good jumping off point. But these are going to be different banks and um, credit unions, things like that, that will lend private education loans to students. And, and Nikki, since we might have some grad students, um, yeah. would you mind talking a little bit about how that differs on the grad side? Definitely. Yeah. So um, at the graduate level, the two main forms of federal loans are going to be the unsubsidized loan and then the graduate plus loan. So graduate students are eligible for $20,500 in the unsubsidized loan per academic year. And then many graduate students do choose to supplement that with graduate plus loan funding. Um, the main difference between the unsubsidized loan and graduate plus loan funding is that the graduate plus loan does do a basic credit check to determine if the student is credit approved or denied for the loan. It's still a pretty simple process. The application just takes about 15 minutes or so, and our office would be happy to point you in the right direction and help you through that process. But that is going to be the main difference between those two. Um, and then private education loans are also available for graduate students to apply for as well. Right. And, you know, I, we probably should mention for the grad students here, CSS profile is only an undergraduate application. Mm -hmm. So graduate, you will still fill out the FAFSA to be eligible for that, um, that those loans that that uh, Nikki just laid out. Uh, but there is no CSS on the on the grad side. Uh, and on the Lamont 
scholarship side for grads, it's a little more varied because we have some graduate teaching assistantships, we have graduate dean scholarship, we have some donor money. Um, we combine all of those things. So in that way, it's similar to the undergrad side where you'll get one line item, one lump sum for the scholarships that you've been awarded. Um, so in some ways it's more complicated because there are more scholarships available on the grad side, more types of scholarships available. And in some ways it's far less complicated because you just fill out the FAFSA if you want to be considered for, um, for loans and student employment opportunities, which Nikki will talk about now. Yeah, so student employment. So if a student is interested in work study, this is a form of need-based federal aid. Um, so work study is basically a student is offered an amount and then they are able to go get a job generally on campus um, that is hiring for work study students and then they receive a paycheck every week or every two weeks like normal. Um, the biggest thing to remember is that this isn't going to actually go directly towards your student's bill or your student bill. You're going to get it in a paycheck just like you would, would an outside job. So I am a huge proponent of this right? because in music in particular, we have all kinds of work study opportunities for students who have this, this award, right? So you can come work in the office of admission, you can work in the PR office, you can work in the box office, all these different opportunities, the music library. And it's not just a paycheck, right? This is something where you can start gaining experience in the industry as an undergraduate or a graduate. Most of us who are in music admission or music administration more broadly have kind of got their start as a work study student back in whatever, you know, whatever program we were pursuing, kind of opened our eyes to the possibilities outside of kind of what we had what we had thought presupposed was the track a musician should follow. So if you are eligible for this and, and you are as part of your financial aid package, highly recommend taking advantage of it. Um, reach out to Lamont offices if that comes to pass and, and we'll, we'll find you a place to work at Lamont, it's great. So appealing your aid offer. Nikki mentioned this earlier. Because we're taking 2020 year taxes, there may be substantive change in your financial situation between when you apply, when you fill out the FAFSA and CSS, and when you actually matriculate or start at DU. Um, so the appeals process for music students is a little bit, a little bit different. You will start with, with me uh, because something may happen, you'll get, you'll get your aid, and you'll say, oh, I really wanna to go to Lamont, but I can't quite make this work. There's something going on that didn't show up in the documents. Uh, can we talk about it? So you start with me. We have a Lamont process where you'll provide um, uh, the narrative. Tell me the story. Tell me what's going on in, in, your, uh, in your situation and, and the number, what it is it that you're, that you're asking for. And we can go through that process here on the Lamont side of things. Um, if, there is a substantial difference in income particularly. Like there's something that will change that ESC number that, um, that uh, Nikki talked about earlier. I will route you over to the Office of Financial Aid to go through their, their kind of formal special circumstance appeal. Um, again, that's mostly because even if it doesn't affect the outcome of your Lamont scholarship, we wanna make sure that you're eligible for all the different types of federal and state aid that Nikki laid out, right? And your ESC, uh, uh, may have something to do with that. So start with me and I can move you along to the Office of Financial Aid if necessary. Uh, that process will start after you get your awards. So we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, March, mid-March is when you'll hear from us about music awards. So uh, this appeals process kind of happens between March, March and May and into the summer in some cases. Nikki, is there anything else you want to add about that before we... I guess we have this examples that you can talk about as well. Yeah, I'll dive in a little bit deeper. So um, on this screen is just some examples that may qualify for a special circumstance. It's definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, mm -hmm. If you have something, just feel free to reach out to our office and we kind of kind of walk you through that process. Um, but we do have some that generally do not qualify for a special circumstance. Um, and as Steven said, we do want you to wait until you have received your initial aid offer before we would qualify um, or before we would walk you through the appeal process. Um, so you can get your aid offer, you know, talk to Steven. Steven can get you over to our office. If there is something that is appealable, we can get you the form and we'll let you know what documents we need. Generally, it's gonna be the most recent tax return you have. If you don't have that, we'll ask for pay stubs or W-2s, um, some sort of letter of explanation, explanation. It's really just gonna depend on what the circumstance is. So it's gonna be really personalized. Um, so we just really encourage you to get in contact with our offices so that we can help you through that process. 
definitely. All right, so what's next? What can you expect going forward? What should you be doing? Um, so the first one, make sure you've done the FAFSA and CSS profile. Uh, that is available now, right? It's been available since early October. So go ahead and get started on that. If you are a rising, if you're a senior now, if you're applying to, um, to college now, or if you're a um, graduating undergrad and you're looking at grad school, go ahead and do that now. <laughs> this one seems silly, right? This next one seems obvious. I can't tell you how often I talk to someone who was like, oh, I needed to know that. I didn't, I didn't pay attention to that Office of Financial Aid email. Especially for music students, they'll, they'll think that they are only getting information from, from Lamont, from music offices, when the, office, the, the emails they're getting from financial aid are so important and really matter when it comes to determining aid later on. So don't ignore emails from the Office of Financial Aid. Check your email. The email that you put on your application is the one that we're using, so make sure you're checking that one. Uh, log into your application status portal for required documents keep on that throughout this process because it's easy to kind of let things fall by the wayside. Um, research and apply for private scholarships. Uh, there's a part of our website that has some information about that, um, but put the feelers out there. They typically come in smaller uh, increments and they do require something often from the applicant. So it's good to get started early on those and every little bit helps. Uh, those music scholarships often are, you know, may require you to do a little performance or something like that. Don't turn away any of those opportunities. Every little bit helps through, through um, to make this uh, affordable. I mentioned music scholarships are sent in mid-March. So uh, for undergrads and grads, for undergrads in particular, you'll hear from the Office of Admission, uh, usually late February, sometimes into early March. And then you'll get more information from Lamont about music scholarship. Uh, and you'll actually get information to then from Nikki's office that shows that full cost of attendance and all the different types of awards that you are getting, the full financial aid package for that year. So you can be on the lookout for that. Graduate students, the admission and financial, admission and scholarship part come in one email on March 15th. And then again, you'll get a, a cost of attendance financial aid letter from the Office of Financial Aid um, a little bit later than that. Um, yeah, and then we hit this at the beginning. We told you we'd hit it throughout reach out to us. I mean, we, we don't get sick of saying, right, that we're here to help you navigate this process and ultimately, hopefully, to make DU a possibility for you, right? So it, I know it's cliche, but there aren't dumb questions. Reach out. Reach out to Nikki's office, to my office. We'll make sure you get to the place you need to get in order to have your questions answered. Um, this is what we're here to do. So don't hesitate to reach out. We know it can be complicated. And uh, it's, but it's worth being clear about what to expect when you get to school, what the costs are going to be and how you're going to make it work for the next four years or two years if you're a grad student. So that brings us to the end. We'll, we'll put up this contact information which shows our, our offices. I'll leave that up just for a second and then we'll, um, we'll turn this PowerPoint off and, and answer any questions you have. So jot down that contact info, think about your questions, pop them in the Q&A, and uh, we'd love to answer them for you. I'm also going to drop my email address in the chat. All right, what questions do you have, folks? Anything that we didn't hit, anything that was super confusing that we did hit, um, put them in there. And of course, you know, contact information was there, my email is there. If, if questions aren't forthcoming right now, or you just need a little bit of time to marinate on what we, uh, um, what we presented, feel free to shoot us emails later on. This will also be posted to our YouTube channel. So uh, Lamont's YouTube channel will have this on there. Uh, so if you wanna revisit it or, or distribute it to all your friends, because I know that we have all these friends waiting to hear about financial aid information. So you can send this to them. All right, folks, I'm not seeing any questions come in. We'll give it one or two more minutes and then we'll, we'll take off. All 
right, Nick, anything you want to add before we sign off? No, I think you said it best. We're, we're here to help. We're here to answer any questions you have. I know both of our offices are super responsive and we want to mm -hmm. get you your information as soon as possible. So just feel free to reach out to us and we will um, get back in touch with you. I know our office is open. We're open for emails all the times, of course. Um, and then we're also open for phones for a majority of the week. Um, and then we're also open for drop-ins um, if you're ever on campus. That's right. And, you know, I should mention too, I know we've already solicited questions, but your questions don't have to be DU or Lamont specific, right? Mm -hmm. I know that Nikki is well versed in, in how different schools do this process, and it's it's relatively similar from place to place. And same with our office. If you have questions about music aid in general, how other schools do it, how to navigate it, um, we can help with that too. Mm -hmm. I think that's I can speak for myself, and I think I know a lot of people in the financial aid feel the same way. I mean, one of the best parts about this job, right, is the educative part of it right that we get to kind of be just a resource to all of you it's not a sales gig we're not trying to sell you necessarily on du or lamont specifically although we'd love to have you here at the end of the day uh we're here to just kind of help help you navigate the college process more broadly all right and on that i think we'll just sign off so thank you so much for being here Oop. Right, one check just came in really quick Yeah, and actually I'll answer that out loud, Joe, if you don't mind, because um, there may be folks watching this later or who, who are on here that uh, that have that same question. So the, the question is, is there a separate application for the Newman Fellowship um, and how often are TAs offered to MM orchestral conducting students? So this is a grad specific question. For the Newman Fellowship, uh, all you need to do to be considered for the Newman Fellowship as a master's student in performance or conducting is submit the required audition material. So there's the audition to get into Lamont, but then there's an additional video that you need to submit for the Newman Fellowship that it, it's it's repertoire consisting of, um, that would make up a half recital or if, or if you're a conductor uh, as the main performer of that recital or of that concert. So make sure you include that in your application. Other than that, there's nothing you need to do because what will happen internally is you'll go through the, the audition process and our faculty will kind of um, flag folks who they think would be good for consideration. And then there's a broader process of reviewing the application, uh, the audition videos for those people and selecting a Newman Fellow. So aside from submitting that video, you don't need to do anything special for the Newman Fellowship. Um, TAs, that's similar. I know you didn't ask this, Joe, but since we're talking about applications, I'm gonna add it. You don't have to do anything special to be considered for a graduate teaching assistantship in your immediate area. So if you're a violinist, you don't have to do anything specific, special to be considered for a string department TA. If you are interested, in, you're a violinist, let's say, let's keep it with that, and you're interested in a musicology or a music theory TA, there are additional requirements for those. We put them on our website. Really, it's, you know, you have to submit a research paper and a little bit of video of your teaching because that's a more traditional classroom teaching space. And so um, they want to see how you perform those, those duties. So unless you're interested in one of those kind of academic TAs, you don't do anything special for that. For orchestral conducting students, so Joe, you're in a kind of a special place in that if you are a master's student in orchestral conducting, uh, you will be awarded a TA in, or, in orchestral conducting. That's, that we only accept one student a year in that program, and so that TA is, is reserved for that person. Great question. Thanks for bringing that up, because I know that kind of, some of that grad-specific stuff uh, will be interesting. It will be of interest to um, to our applicants later on. Any other things? Any other questions? You got one right in there at the buzzer. Joe is great. All right. Well, thank you all again for being here, Nikki. Thank you for joining me on this. Really appreciate it. Um, be in touch if you have questions. Otherwise, best of luck on your application and auditions. And I uh, just can't wait to get to know you a little bit better through this process. Have a good rest of the night.